recent developments in our understanding of cord clamping and lung aeration. And I'd like to start by paying a, a, a debt of gratitude to my colleague, uh, Stuart Hooper, a physiologist who's really revolutionized the way we look at this uh, important transition from fetus to newborn. Uh, we're particularly going to look at the cardiovascular changes, and the respiratory changes, and most importantly, the combination of those two systems, uh, how they change together. I'd like to convince you today that uh, delayed or deferred cord clamping is more than just a placental transfusion to the newborn baby. So for, for quite some time now, uh, we've recognized that delayed cord, cord clamping for at least a minute after birth is the most appropriate way to manage term babies not requiring resuscitation. That uh, directive has been with us since 2010. So turning our attention to the group of vulnerable infants, those are the preterm babies, there's been an increasing amount uh, written about these babies. And when we looked at the literature in 2015, there were 16 articles, 12 randomized trials, four observational studies uh, with more than a thousand babies in, in total that looked at this question, when should we clamp the umbilical cord of a preterm baby? The important thing to realize about these articles that all of these studies excluded babies who needed resuscitation. Now, when these articles were looked at, there was no difference between the groups uh, in terms of their mortality or rates of severe intraventricular hemorrhage. There was no evidence regarding neurodevelopment. There was a suggestion that delayed cord clamping reduced the risk of any intraventricular hemorrhage and it improved hemodynamic stability for preterm babies in the first hours of life. They seem to need less inotrope uh, support. So at, at this time, we made a, a fairly weak recommendation. We suggested delayed cord clamping for preterm infants, not, a, not requiring immediate resuscitation. That's a weak recommendation, and it's very, based on very low quality evidence. Since then, we've had a new large randomized trial that's added to the, uh, to the evidence base to help us understand this question. And this has been brought into the uh, overall body of evidence in a, in a recent meta-analysis. And we can see that when delayed and early clamping are compared with respect to the important outcome of mortality, there is now a statistically significant benefit to delayed cord clamping. It produces a 32% reduction in mortality. The confidence intervals don't include one. Treat one baby with delayed cord clamping and you'll prevent one death. And this statistic here, the I squared statistic, tells us the results of all of the trials making up this pooled analysis are consistent with one another. So this is good quality evidence. So if we look uh, again at the, the physiology and the changes that happen at birth to the circulation, if we start with the fetus, and you'll remember that blood returning from the placenta mixes with that from the lower body, goes through the ductus arteriosus, and whereas uh, it would normally go to the right heart, it is generally shunted across the foramen ovale, across the atrial septum, and into the left atrium, and then the left ventricle. From there, it's pumped into the, uh, into the body, uh, the upper body, and back to the lower body and the placenta. The, sm the small amount of blood that does come back to the right heart is largely shunted across the ductus arteriosus. So the lungs, not being an organ of uh, gas exchange at this point and being fluid filled, um, receives very little in the way of circulation. And shortly after birth, the, uh, the fetus moves to the adult pattern of, of blood supply where blood returns from the body to the right side of the heart, pumped to the, by the pulmonary arteries to the lungs, returns through the pulmonary uh, veins to the left atrium, to the left ventricle, and then pumped out to the, to the body. 
So we've got two very different systems, the, the adult, the two sides of the heart functioning in series, and in the uh, fetus, the heart, two sides of the heart functioning in parallel. What I'd like to, to focus on is where the left ventricle gets its blood from. In the adult, the left ventricular preload comes from the lungs, from pulmonary veins, draining the lungs, left atrium, left ventricle. For the fetus, the left ventricular preload comes from the umbilical venous supply, returns through the foramen ovale uh, and into the left atrium and then to the left ventricle. So the interesting thing about that is that the left ventricular preload in both the adult and the fetus comes from the organ of gas exchange. In the adult, the lungs, in the fetus, the placenta. So then we have to consider what happens when we clamp the umbilical cord uh, after birth and what the effects are on the cardiovascular system. There's lots of changes going on as this fetus becomes a newborn and after birth, the left ventricular preload must switch from the umbilical veins to the pulmonary veins. And that means that the lungs have to aerate, they have to expand, and in doing so, the pulmonary vascular resistance has to fall. So it therefore follows that if you clamp the cord before the lung aerates, there is an immediate reduction in left ventricular preload and also an increase in left ventricular afterload causing a decrease in left ventricular output. And this is a bad thing for the, for the newborn baby that's struggling to adapt to outside life. This has led us to think about the timing of cord clamping and to suggest that it shouldn't, maybe it shouldn't be based on what the clock says, wait 30 seconds or wait a minute. Maybe it should wait on what the baby is telling us. It should be based on the baby's physio physiology so that we should wait until the lung aerates and the pulmonary blood flow increases before we, we clamp and cut the cord. That way the, the pulmonary blood flow is able to immediately take over the role of providing preload for the left ventricle following, uh, following cord clamping. So the, the next question is, um, if delayed cord clamping is good for normal babies, what about babies who need some help, need our help aerating their lungs, need help with their breathing, they need resuscitation? And the, the logic here is that the um, by establishing uh, lung aeration before we clamp the cord will make a difficult situation better for the babies. And so the question then becomes, can we actually uh, administer newborn resuscitation while the baby is still attached to the umbilical cord? I'd just like to show you a, a video to illustrate that, yes, this is possible. So this is a, a term baby being, uh, being delivered. Got a, just got to stop it there. We've got a researcher uh, and a pediatrician scrubbed into the field. The, uh, the clinician has a bag and mask that has been sterilized and between, sorry, between the T-piece and the mask, we have a device here that will measure tidal volume and measure carbon dioxide being excreted by the lungs. So the baby comes out. We're going to measure the heart rate using ultrasound and it's, uh, it's quite good at the, at the beginning of the resuscitation. It's 132 beats per minute. Just need to straighten out the umbilical cord so it's not on, under any tension. And having been quite active and vigorous early on at, a, at about a minute of age, the baby suddenly becomes quite floppy, stops breathing the heart rate drops a little bit from the high 130s down to 120s. And in spite of some stimulation, the baby doesn't respond. So we start giving some bag, uh, some mask ventilation, measuring the tidal volume, measuring the carbon dioxide, standard pressures, 30 on five, giving a tidal volume of four mils per kilo. So that should be sufficient. 
initially we see no carbon dioxide coming back, but within a couple of inflations, we do see some CO2 returning. The baby starts to cry. Starts to move. Heart rate is now back up to 140. So we give the, uh, give the baby another minute after we've seen carbon dioxide coming from the lungs and then we clamp the cord, cut the cord and the baby lives happily ever after. So it is feasible to, um, to uh, initiate resuscitation while the baby is still on, attached to the placenta via the cord. It's possible, we don't yet know that it is a better way of resuscitating babies, but I'll flag that uh, for, as something to keep your eyes on. Now, I, I listened to uh, the last session and there was a little bit of talk about cord milking or cord stripping. This seems like a very good idea. It, it gives us a quick method of uh, transferring blood to the newborn baby prior to resuscitation. So if we want to get to the baby quickly to resuscitate and we want to cu cut the cord quickly, then cord milking enables us to do that. When we looked in 2015, there were a small number of trials and a very small number of babies comparing uh, cord clamping sorry, early cord clamping with milking. There were none comparing delayed cord clamping with milking. We found no evidence of a difference in rates of death. None of these babies were followed into infancy to assess their neurodevelopment. No difference in the use of phototherapy. There was some low quality evidence showing a reduction in rates of all intraventricular hemorrhage. At this point, we suggested against the routine use of cord milking for infants born at less than 28 weeks, noting that there were trials underway that would help us decide. In the meantime, we were doing some animal work on cord milking and, and found some fairly interesting uh, things. Uh, we've got three graphs here. This is the net umbilical blood flow in purple, the carotid artery blood pressure in red, and the carotid blood carotid artery blood flow in blue. Each of these black vertical lines is an episode of milking. So the, the cord is being milked with each of these episodes. And what you can see is with each milking, there is a, a surge in blood pressure and a surge in carotid artery blood flow with each successive milk. milk. And as Ayman said, this poses a risk to the preterm baby. This is one of the things that we uh, believe is in the cause, causal pathway of intraventricular hemorrhage, these sudden surges of blood pressure and blood flow to the delicate circulation of the brain. In contrast, this is a lamb that was ventilated first before uh, the cord was clamped here. And you can see that the carotid artery blood pressure and the blood flow is very stable throughout the, uh, throughout the resuscitation and following cord clamping. Anup Katheria did a, a very nice and important study uh, comparing delayed cord clamping with umbilical uh, cord milking and looking at the important outcome of death or severe intraventricular hemorrhage. Uh, this was done in preterm babies. The primary outcome was not significantly different between the two groups, although the, uh, the umbilical cord milking group had a rate of 12% versus 8% in the delayed cord clamping group. The problem uh, with this study, or the problem that this study uh, revealed, was a higher rate of severe intraventricular hemorrhage in the most immature babies, 22% versus 6%. And at that point, the data safety uh, board recommended stopping recruitment after an interim analysis. And the authors concluded here that the centers practicing umbilical cord milking should, could, should consider discontinuing this practice in the tiniest babies. Now just uh, going to switch tack a little bit and, and talk about aeration of the lung. Textbooks tell us uh, the physiology of, of air liquid clearance, and we know that that's the fundamental task of uh, the baby following birth needs to clear the lungs of fluid and then start to exchange blood gases. 
The textbooks would tell us that this is due to sodium reabsorption, uh, sodium coming in and taking with it water across the epithelium and clearing the lungs of water. In fact, that's a very slow mechanism for clearing lung fluid and, and won't help the baby in the first minutes of life. The other mechanism is, is the squeeze that the baby goes through as in the uh, birthing process, a posture induced increase in transpulmonary pressure. But the most important um, mechanism for clearing lung fluid is the increase in pressure generating by the baby's inspiration. And this is illustrated quite nicely in this, this graphic. Fluid is driven down the airways, the, the, the big, big airways, the small airways, into the alveoli and then across into the interstitium of the lung with successive inflations. And that, uh, that process ha happens very quickly. And then over the following four to six hours, that fluid is removed from the lungs through the lymphatics. And this gave rise to the notion that perhaps uh, instead of giving intermittent short breaths, we should be giving babies in the first minute or two of life sustained inflations. And the rationale here is that if you can establish a functional residual capacity quickly, we'll improve the outcomes following resuscitation. And there was strong evidence uh, at this stage from animals, in the lamb and rabbit models, that sustained inflations were safe and effective. I think I might have shown this, uh, this image before at, at this meeting. This is a rabbit undergoing a sustained inflation. And you can see that this results in a slow, steady inflation of the lungs up to total lung capacity. So we fully aerate the lungs and then start tidal uh, breathing and we've established a functional residual capacity. We can very quickly uh, establish gas exchange. So a very promising way of, of doing things. Back in 2015, there were three randomized trials, two cohort studies, um, and the evidence was not particularly strong. There was no benefit in terms of death rate or bronchopulmonary dysplasia or air leak. There was some low quality evidence of a decreased need for mechanical ventilation. So ILCOR's recommendation at this stage was against the routine use of initial sustained inflation for preterm infants without spontaneous respirations. But they suggested that it could go on in research settings. And so the values and preferences that guided this recommendation were the absence of long-term benefits and a lack of clarity on how to administer sustained inflations. And in, it was done in the knowledge that there was a large randomized trial underway. And this trial was the SAIL trial. It was published last year. And it uh, in includes some very valuable lessons. So it started off with this, this rationale that um, if we wanted to establish gas exchange quickly and, and therefore resuscitate the baby quickly, um, it would be good to expand the lungs as quickly as possible. If we do the physics, we know that liquid filled lungs have a longer time constant than gas filled lungs. And therefore it's, it made sense for a long, slow uh, inflation rather than short, sharp inflations. We had the animal evidence that uh, sustained inflations worked very well, but we knew in those animals, they were intubated and sedated, not being, um, not being potentially vigorous and not being uh, mask ventilated. When we started the SAIL trial, there was limited human experimental data. And most importantly, there was this geographical divide. So sustained inflations were commonly practiced in Europe, but hardly practiced at all in the United States. So, so there was this tension between two ways of doing things and the umpire, Ilcor, was agnostic, would not really uh, express a strong opinion either way. So the hypothesis for the sale, sale study was that babies between 23 and 27 weeks who required positive pressure ventilation in the first minutes of life, that a sustained inflation, that meant 20 centimetres of water for 15 seconds, repeated at, uh, at 25 centimetres if that was required, was better than uh, intermittent, standard intermittent positive pressure ventilation with PEEP, 
in terms of producing a lower rate of death or bronchopulmonary dysplasia uh, measured at 36 weeks according to the Walsh definition. And this is the, uh, the, the types of mothers and babies where we were looking at. There were very high rates of uh, antenatal steroid use. About two thirds of the babies were getting cesarean section. These are quite small babies in the 700 uh, gram range and uh, quite a, a few were from multiple pregnancies. The primary outcome, death or BPD, was lower in the control group. So the control group did better. This was not statistically significant, a p-value of 0 .0, sorry, 0 0.22. Most of that difference or all of that difference was made up by a reduction in death. Rates of BPD, very similar. Nothing there is statistically significant. Likewise, no significant differences in any of the secondary outcomes. Uh, the need for surfactant either in the delivery room or at any time during the NICU admission, no uh, increase or change in chest compression rates, requirement for intubation in the delivery room, and then some of the NICU outcomes, necrotizing enterocolitis, retinopathy of prematurity and patent ductus arteriosus, all quite similar between the groups. When we looked at some of the other uh, adverse event, events, these were pre-specified. The one that caught everybody's attention was this one, and this was uh, the rate of death in the first 48 hours of life, which was substantially greater in the, in the sustained inflation group. So 7.4% versus 1.4% statistically significant. Interestingly, no um, mechanism to explain that, no uh, difference in intraventricular hemorrhage rates, no sign of uh, more air leak in the babies uh, receiving sustained inflation, and no early evidence of uh, lung disease in these babies. So uh, an increased death rate, but not, explain not explainable. So, at the end of the study, we had to conclude that in extremely preterm infants requiring resuscitation at birth, up to two sustained inflations does not reduce the risk of BPD or death, but it might increase early mortality. So this was an important lesson, I think, for, for all of us that um, sometimes the work that we see in the animal lab does not translate well into the human uh, neonatal intensive care situation. So we're going to finish up with mask ventilation. That's the mainstay of, of what we do in the, in the delivery room. We ventilate babies mostly using a mask. And I've showed you this slide before, but it just shows you how we collect data. Uh, we have a, a T-piece here, a mask, and between them, a flow sensor that enables us to measure gas flow into and out of the baby and produce um, graphs like this. Uh, we, we see a pressure curve. So we're delivering pressures of 30, a peak pressure of 30, a peep of five. We're seeing flow uh, going in towards the baby in green and then coming out from the baby through the mask and, and back towards the uh, T piece below the line. And then that uh, flow is integrated to give us tidal volume. So tidal volume in, inspiratory tidal volume, and then the same tidal volume coming out. But that was the ideal situation. This is what we saw from time to time. We saw we're generating good pressures, 30 on five as before, but we're not generating any gas flow either in or out of the baby and therefore not effectively ventilating the baby, providing no tidal ventilation. We found this was relatively common, a, a quite a severe reduction in expired tidal volume was seen in about a quarter of our resuscitations. So I think this explains why sometimes mask ventilation just does not seem to work. But we now have a, a, at least a partial explanation for why this might be so. And it comes again from the uh, animal work. Um, and this is a rabbit model. So you can see the chest end of the rabbit here, the head end up here. You can see the trachea 
going here. The glottis just here is open, the epiglottis is open, so there is a clear pathway from the pharynx into the trachea, seen in close up and highlighted uh, in this sub diagram. That is quite a, an unusual picture in the first minute or two of life. More, much more commonly, we see that there is closure of the glottis and a closure of the epiglottis. So there is no connection between the trachea and the pharynx. Here's a rabbit that's being ventilated with this closed glottis. And we can see that the esophagus is becoming distended with air and the stomach is becoming distended with air. And I think this is a, uh, a picture that will resonate with, with many of you who have been in the, uh, in the delivery suite and tried to bag and mask a baby, blown up the stomach and not been able to successfully resuscitate the baby. Now the explanation for this is that it is normal for the glottis and the epiglottis to be mostly closed during fetal life. And this is what allows a pressure to develop behind the closed glottis that allows for lung growth. And it helps us remind us that these rabbit pups and our very preterm babies are exposed fetuses and that they react in that way. Their, their default position is to have a closed glottis and epiglottis. Once we aerate the lung and establish regular respirations, then the glottis and the epiglottis are mostly open and then mask ventilation will work. One of the things that was noted in the animal lab, the things that would trigger apnea and, and lead to unsuccessful mask ventilation were hypoxia, hypothermia, and the placement of a face mask on the, on the face of the animal. Which brings us to our final, um, final little section and, and looking at what happens when you put a face mask on a preterm baby at birth. And this was some very nice work that was done by some Dutch colleagues. They looked at more than 400 babies, less than 32 weeks gestation, and found that 86% of these babies were breathing before the mask was applied to their face, but about a half of them stopped breathing as soon as the mask went on. And they found that this effect was greater as the babies became more immature. And there is a physiological explanation for that, and it's called the trigeminal cardiac reflex, whereby the stimulation of the trigeminal nerve by the touch receptors on the face can provoke breath holding and apnea, a reduction in heart rate and changes in blood pressure. And I think we would all recognize that this happens uh, from time to time in our deliveries. So just to finish off in summary, delayed cord clamping is recommended for term and preterm infants. Thinking about it, physiological based cord clamping, waiting till the baby has established effective ventilation might be more beneficial and there are studies underway to assess that. We believe that this concept may be able to be applied to neonatal resuscitation and stabilization, particularly for preterm babies, but this again needs to be tested in randomized trials. I would agree with Ayman that cord milking is not recommended for extremely preterm infants. Sustained inflations, although, uh, although promising, are not the answer to quickly aerating the preterm lung. And we know a little bit more about why mask ventilation sometimes doesn't work. Airway obstruction is a common cause of, of this problem. And we know now that obstruction occurs at the level of the glottis and the epiglottis. So with that, I'll uh, stop and I, I'll uh, await questions later on in the, uh, in the day.